the sea is not only a great part of our unique history in Hull, but it also provides lots of opportunities for the future. Hull it has been a seafaring port from its inception in the 1100s. Hull became, uh, by some measures, the largest fishing port in the world. The Blades House is an 18th century merchant house. Um, it was home of the Blades family. Uh, they were dominant in, in Hull uh, commerce and shipping for over 200 years. Built a lot of very famous ships, the most famous one that most people know that was built by the Blades was the Bounty. Uh, it's now the home of the Maritime Historical Studies Centre, uh, part of the University of Hull, and people who work and are involved in here in involved in all aspects of the history uh, of the sea and of man's interaction with the oceans. The Hull, Hull's fishing industry in one respect goes back a very, very long time. Um, back in the uh, 1400s, uh, Hull had a, had a fishing industry in the sense that uh, Hull vessels used to voyage to Iceland uh, to collect fish, um, which was called dried fish, stock fish as it was known. It was a medieval staple, something you could eat during the winter. It was wind dried and preserved. It was a three day voyage to Iceland um, and, and a bit longer if you were going to the Barents Sea, etc. So the, the, you would have three days voyage out and then while you were there, you would, your, your aim would be to have fish as much and as often as possible to catch, you know, the, the amount of fish of the types that you wanted. So it was an extremely dangerous job. You were fishing quite often in many of these waters, either close to or north of the Arctic Circle, in all seasons of the year. Uh, and of course, many of the actions of fishing were taking place on an open deck. So it was an extremely hazardous job, right? but it bred some of the finest seafarers the 20th century has ever seen. The real story is, is when you become a fisherman yourself and you go regular, each three week trip is different. So the first trip when you was pleasure was nice because you scored for lucky weather. But once you signed your high school and become a crew member, and so you left that dock and you went into the North Sea, it could be a storm, it could be force eight gales, which is never so bad. So although the job was hard, the modernisation should make it easier. But the modern station still made it hard. You still had the ships getting lost, your crew getting injured, the dangerous work, the still 18 hours a day, nothing was changed. So no matter how much they modernised the ship, the working standard itself stayed the same. The dangers were still there, the sea was still there, and the ships were still getting lost. Well, the Arctic Corsair is a wonderful ship, it's one of the, the last sidewinders as they call side trawlers to be built. It was built at, uh, at Beverley uh, and of course it had a very long uh, career as, as a fishing vessel. In later life it was also used for other work, oil rig supply vessels. But today it stands as a good example of the later stages of the, of the industry. There's no what you call what say, keeping an eye on the ships because the captains wanted to catch as much fish as they could. So they went to their own fishing grounds where it was secret. Well, the captain, thinking, I can't waste fishing time, I'll get a sack. I don't get no fish, but it's still lots to go. So he still said, my... So when they invented the 200 mile fishing limit, there was no way he could get back to port with an injured man for the hospitals. I was born into the fishmonger's trade. I was actually born in a wet fish shop um, in Grimsby, in the middle of Victoria Street. And I was certainly destined to be a fisherman because I was weighed on fish scales in a wet fish shop, and that's the truth. Of course, we haven't got the trawlers anymore. So what we do, we'll be able to buy it. Most of it's come from Iceland, Norway, Ireland, uh, far places. Local decline, very much so. But uh, over the years, we have to sort of like source wherever we can. But if we can do it locally, by all means, we do it locally. So it goes into the bridge section. And I walked into the room and there's nobody on the bridge. It was just my mate, who I knew, Fred. And I said, uh, I come up to give you a spell for him the wheel. And he went, it steers itself. 
they'd invented what you call automatic steering, the ship could steer itself, and I'd never seen one before, I couldn't believe it, a ship steering itself. <laughs> so it's another adventure, watching ships steer by themselves. The decline of the fishing industry uh, coincided with uh, the, the redevelopment or the, the rebuilding of many houses and parts of the town. It coincided almost with the clearance of many of the houses that had been built for the fishermen. So a whole community was dispersed, scattered to the winds. In other respects, large numbers of people who worked in a very specialist industry were thrown out of work. I think the psychological impact of the decline of the fishing industry was extremely large. But there are still plenty of activities related to fishing that the port can be engaged in. There are still people from Hull who go off to fish elsewhere. A very strong processing industry and a large distribution network within the city. So fishing is far from finished in the town and has got an interesting future. After I finished that city I got married and I settled down. I didn't want to go to sea no more. But the fishing industry was having cod wars and things like that, so I could see the trawling industry was going to come to an end. I didn't want to go into these freezer trawlers, once the sidewinder was scrapped. So I decided to get shore jobs. With the fishing days, to try and keep the grandchildren interested. If you look on here, these are all the certificates where I take the grandkids on cruises to the Arctic Circle. Just the Arctic Circle, all the deep sea fishing grounds. So they've been to Norway, Spitsbergen, Iceland, Greenland, and Newfoundland. They've been to all the fishing grounds. All these ships in here, which I've saved and done, they've all got a story, a different story. They come from the old ships all the way down to the modern freezer trawler. These are pictures when I was a trawlerman. That's what life was like. Suits, trubies. Pictures used to be taken in the pubs of the ship you was on. And you used to put your picture alongside it. That's when the docks was really full of trawlers, absolutely full, hundreds of trawlers. No matter what kind of weather it was, you had to work in the area. No complaints, you couldn't say it was cold or it's bad. She went to meet her sister ship and she just vanished. This one here rescued the crew off the of St. Hubert when it blew up after picking a man up. Four of the crew got killed on the St. Hubert. And this ship rescued the rest of the lads in the lifeboats. On these, the freezer trawlers, there was another dangerous ship that used to always set a fire. Lots of them was lost or sunk or set a fire. On this one, 12 men got burnt alive whilst being towed to America, Newfoundland. Which she didn't make it, she just sunk. So when you're talking about the fishing has been hard, it's also dangerous because of these situations. Once so much to work, it's so much of the lifestyle itself. If you're local, like us now, you can't get a job on a ship now. There's no such thing as seamen in England now. It's all foreign labour. So I try to teach the grandkids to remember all this about the trawlerman that's been lost. Hull has a unique maritime history and a unique engagement with sea. It's the sort of thing that you should celebrate.